Hello, my name is Junon Che from KJC Math Circle. I would like to deliver a lecture in the topic of evolution of older Hymenoptera. So my topic is quiet biology rather than mathematics. So I expect you to wonder what older Hymenoptera is. Older Hymenoptera is the biological group that includes bees, bees, wasps, and ants. So older Hymenoptera is the order that is older under class insecta. So this is the contents. So prior to talking about the evolution of older Hymenoptera, I feel it essential to briefly introduce the evolution of the general class insecta because older Hymenoptera is definitely included in class insecta. Then I will talk about how the bees and wasps in the present time arose through the evolutionary process. First, one of the insect's unique and noticeable characteristics is its six legs. However, insects didn't have six legs in the beginning. The ancestors of insects actually had quite a lot of legs like millipedes or centipedes. The left picture is the reconstruction of the insects' ancestors based on the fossils. You can see they had many legs, which is well over six, but the number of legs act as a critical drawback in insect ancestors. If you have raised any species of insects, you may know that insects are very vulnerable during and right after shedding. Their cuticle isn't solidified completely in the process of shedding, so damage to insects during shedding can even threaten their leaves. Ancient insect ancestors, as they had a lot of legs, spent a lot of time shedding. So they were easily hunted while shedding. So the insect ancestors evolved to be much simpler and less legs to shorten its time for shedding. As a result, insects finally ended to have six legs. Another noticeable characteristic of insects is their wings. To better understand, I will show this picture. As you can see, there is two groups of boxed. The first group includes a pegasus, which is a mythical creature. And the second group includes a pterosaur, a parrot, and a bat. If I ask you to include the fly in the middle to either group, what group would you put the fly on? I expect you to put the fly on the second group because the second group includes animals that exist or once existed in the real world, while the first group includes a pegasus which does not exist in the real world. However, when you see their wings, you could notice that all the animals in the second groups get their wings from their forearms transformed, while the pegasus and the fly have their wings on their back, which means they didn't get their wings from their arms. So if we focus on the wings, the fly is more similar to the pegasus rather than other animals. So biologists wondered how and why the wings of insects originated like this way. Evolutionary biologists came up with various hypotheses on how insects developed their wings. These two hypotheses, paranoto hypothesis and epicoxal hypothesis, are the most famous and trusted hypotheses. Paranoto hypothesis suggests that insects developed their wings from its thorax prolonged. The extended thorax first functioned as the glider rather than wings, so they glided from the high trees to the low trees using their extended thorax. The extended thorax then changed to a wing. Epicook's hypothesis is the hypothesis that explains the wing of insects originated from the gills of aquatic larvae. You can see this a picture in the middle. This picture is the larva of dragonfly. And the larva of of a dragonfly is aquatic. As they live underwater, they have gills to breathe. And as you can see, uh, the gills of the larva resemble the wings of the insects. Also, the recent research explains that through molecular evidence, there is high possibility that the wings of insects different from the gills of the larva. And I will talk about why insects invented complete metamorphosis. There are two types of insects, complete metamorphosis and incomplete metamorphosis. I expect you to learn this in uh, at least elementary school or middle, high school, middle school. And complete metamorphosis is a form of insect development that includes four life stages, egg, larva, pupa, and imago. The immature stages of holometabolous insects, which is also 
incomplete metamorphoses are very different from the major stage. Incomplete metamorphosis is the mode of development of certain insects that includes three distinct stages, the egg, nymph, and the other stage or imago. These groups go through gradual changes. There is no pupa stage. The nymph often has a thin exoskeleton and resembles the other stage but lacks wings and functional reproductive organs. Order Hymenoptera, the topic of the lecture, also is the complete metamorphosis. So what is the reason why insects invented complete metamorphosis? Juveniles and other forms of complete metamorphosis insects often occupy different ecological niches, exploiting different resources. This fact is considered a key driver in the usual evolutionary diversification of a form and physiology within this group. For example, there are four flowers and four leaves. As the butterfly utilizes flower as the only food source, and the caterpillar utilizes leaves as the only food source, there would be no competition between butterfly and caterpillar. However, if both butterfly and caterpillar both utilize flowers as food, force, food source, there would be competition and they have to share the food source. So butterflies have to eat two flowers and caterpillars have to eat two flowers. So the complete metamorphosis enables the mature and immature stages of species to avoid competition between. So now I will talk about what ancient wasps were like in the beginning. Actually, Hymenoptera, which is a wasp, is the first insect order that discovered the ecological niche called parasitism. In other words, the first parasitic insects were wasps. People usually remind of bees as having social behavior, having a queen, storing honey, and making hexagon-shaped nests. However, most of the bees and the ancient bees are quite different as what people imagine. They are rather solitary than social, doesn't build hexagon-shaped cells, and they are mostly parasitic. The left bottom is the picture of Echinomoidid wasp. Echinomoidid wasp is parasitic wasp that lays egg on caterpillars. When the egg hatches, the Echinomoidid larva drills inside the flesh of the caterpillars and consumes its intestines and flesh slowly. Ancient parasitic wasps are, were the only parasitic insects, so they were in an advantageous position as they can possess a parasitic ecological niche alone. They reproduced and spread quickly and finally became one of the most prevalent order of class insecta. I want to introduce two species of parasitic wasps, Dinocampus coccinelle and Amplex compressor. Dinocampus coccinelle is a black honeyed wasp parasite of ladybugs. Dinocampus coccinelle has been described as turning its ladybug host into a temporary zombie guarding the wasp cocoon. The mature female wasp seeks out adult female ladybugs, although they will sometimes oviparse into a male adult or larva insta. One egg is planted in the host's soft underbelly. The wasp larva hatches after five to seven days into a first instar larva with large mandibles and proceeds to remove any other eggs or larva before beginning to feed on the ladybugs, fat bodies, and gonads. The wasp larva inside the ladybug goes through four larva instars. Meanwhile, the ladybug continues to forage and feed until the wasp larva. When it is ready to emerge, paralyzes the ladybug before tunneling out. It pupates in a cocoon attached to the, the leg of the living ladybug, whose brightly colored body and occasional twitching reduce predation. A growing Dinocampus coccinelle wasp nested in its cocoon is extremely vulnerable, and other insects will devour it. If one of the predators tries to eat it, the ladybug retaliates, scaring it off. The ladybug becomes the parasite's bodyguard by protecting, protecting it from predators. The, spec, the second species I want to introduce is the emerald cockroach wasp or jewel wasp. Emerald cockroach wasp is a solitary wasp of the family Amplicidae. 
It is known for its unusual reproductive behavior, which involves stinging a cockroach and using it as a host for its larva. The wasp searches for the cockroach in the wild, and when the wasp spots a cockroach, it stings the cockroach exactly on the point of ganglia. The wasp, which is too small to carry the roach, then leads the victim to the wasp's burrow by pulling one of the roach's antennae in a manner similar to a leash. The bottom picture is Amplex Complexa taking cockroach to its own nest. In the burrow, the wasp will lay one or two white eggs about two millimeter long between the roach's legs. It then exits and proceeds to fill in the burrow entrance with any surrounding debris, more to keep other predators and competitors out than to keep the roach in. So, as I have shown these two species, Wasp and bees develop parasitism in various forms. So I will talk about origin of the sting. I would like to explain how and why bees and wasps developed their stings. We all know that honeybees or wasps use their stings to attack the opponents. However, the origin and the original usage of the sting is far from a weapon, actually. The sting originated from an ovipositor. The ovipositor is a tube-like organ used by insects for the laying of eggs. Parasitic wasps try to lay eggs inside the host body rather than exterior of the host movement uh, of the host body because there is a low possibility to be detached or impaired by the host movement. To insert their ovipositor inside the host body and lay eggs, parasitic wasps had to make their ovipositors sharper and harder. When the sting got much sharper and harder, the, the, the stingers were able to use as not only a reproductive organ, but also as a weapon. The, the stinger of aculeata are ovipositors, highly modified and with associated phenom glands. So that was the origin of the stings of bees. Lastly, I would like to explain how bees become a highly socialized insect. The most bees and wasps near us are insects which are social. They cooperate each other and even sacrifice their own lives to protect their community. Worker bees do not reproduce and devote their lives to protecting a queen bee and having, helping the queen bee to lay eggs. This altruistic behavior of bees was one of the hardest riddles for evolutionary biologists to solve because usually organisms show selfish behavior to deliver their own genes to the next generation rather than helping others to spread their genes. This kind of altruistic behavior was finally explained by examining bees in the perspective of their meiosis and fertilization. The left picture is a picture of the usual meiosis and fertilization process. Most of the animals, including humans, reproduce by this process. However, in case of bees, sex determination and meiosis, fertilization process is different. While in most of the animals, the sex chromosome determines the sex of the organism. In bees, whether the eggs are fertilized determines the sex of the organism. As you can see in the right, picture, if the egg is fertilized, the bees appear to be female. And if the egg isn't fertilized, the bees appear to be male. This mechanism of fertilization and sex determination affects the gene similarity between relatives. So quite simply, a bee worker shares 75% of her genes with her sisters whereas we share only 50% of our genes with our brothers or sisters, as you can see in the left picture. And the reason for this difference is that we are diploid animals and bees are hyploid animals. Okay, so, well, let me try to explain. In diploid animals, both the male and the female have two sets of chromosomes. The female egg contains one of the two sets and the male sperm contains one of the two sets. So, when the fertilization occurs, the fertilized egg again contains two sets of chromosomes, half from the male and half from the female. 
So the average degree of relatedness between sisters and brothers is 54%. So humans are diploid. In hyploid animals, the male has only one set of chromosomes as he develops from an unfertilized egg. So every sperm contains the same single set of chromosomes. In other words, he passes on 100% of his genes in each sperm. The female, however, is diploid, so has two sets of chromosomes, and each egg will contain one of these two sets. As males develop from unfertilized eggs, this means that sons will have 100% of their genes in common with the female, their mother, and in bees, this will be the queen. This also means that male bees have no father as they do not receive any genes from him at all. Also, the queen passed on only half of her genes to her son, so she is related to him by just 50%. So to recap all, males are related to the queen 100%, all males are fatherless, all queens are related to their sons 50%, and the workers will also have received one set of the possible two of the queen's chromosomes, so they will be 50% related to her. And they will also have received the one set that their father had. And because the male had just one set of chromosomes to pass on, he is 100% related to his daughters. This makes females 50% related to their queens and 50% related to their father. And fathers 100% related to their daughters. The relatedness between sisters, each sister receives one of a possible two set of chromosomes from the queen, and this make up half her genes, so there is a 50% chance that 50% of her genes will be the same of her sisters. So thus, 50% multiply 50% is 25%. Then both sisters get the same gene of from the male, their father, as he has only one set. So half their genes are exactly the same. And if you add this half to the 25%, from the queen, from the, are exactly the same, and you get a relatedness of 75% between sisters. This means that sisters are more related to each other than they are to their mothers, father, or even any daughters they could have. So if a worker wants to pass on her genes, it's, it makes sense for her to pass them on through sisters who will be raised as queens as they will have 75% of her genes. If a worker did have daughters, they would get just 50% of her genes. All her brothers are just 25% related to her, so they are in effect half brothers as they had no father. They have just one set of their mother's chromosomes, so there is a 50% chance that they will share 50% of their six sister's genes. This means that if the worker lays her own unfertilized eggs, they will be 50% related to her as they will have one of her two sets of chromosomes. It is this that leads to the chaos and breakdown of harmony in a bee nest towards the end of summer. However, there is one major assumption here and that is that the queen mates with only one male. And we know that this is rarely the case in honeybees and probably not in some of the other social insects. This explains why honeybees appear to be altruistic and it was revealed that even the behavior of honeybees we believe to be altruistic was also the selfish behavior to spread its own genes. This is the end of my presentation. If you know, if you now understand the long and complex evolution steps of bees, I suggest to rather than immediately slapping or running away from bees, just pause and watch the magnificent and beautiful result of bees.